something like that, more of this, less of that. That's George Lucas making the prequel trilogy. You know, he's got a whole art department of human artists elaborating ideas, very simple ideas that he has given them. And then, you know, they have meetings and he walks through with the marker and he circles this. Yes, I like that. No, not that. And basically we all get to be George Lucas, you know? Uh, so there is creativity. You know, people mock the whole notion of a prompt engineer, you know, like describing what you want is no particular skill. And yet if you go to some AI platform and you try to create a particular type of image, you will be very frustrated to discover that the AI cannot read your mind and that you have to you have to learn the vocabulary and learn what phrases and what word order and, you know, what uh, technical descriptions actually get the AI to produce something similar to what you had in mind so okay i want to jump in here with a thought mm -hmm. <laughs> just to hammer home my my previous comment so we are very 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 close to being in a world where what you think can be projected on a screen and they already have technology where your dreams can kind of like show up as as visual images so the, the even the prompt engineer right now it's a hot new thing and you do see advertisements like job ads for them <laughs> We're going to have thought engineers literally before too long. And then it's going to be people who just have like very active imaginations that they just put a little thing on the side of their forehead and then they iterate, 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 bam. Then they have like, you know, a movie or whatever, you know, like, so even even the prompt engineer, it's going to be outdated before we even know, which is hilarious. Um, yeah, uh, I, have, I have actually have a, a side question that I'm curious to get your guys' thoughts on because this was kind of brought up. I just wrote an article on Substack um, for my, liter my literary journal, Jokes Review, and it posed the question that I'm still mulling over of when should we call people out for creating writing by AI and then passing it off as their own? And in this article, I actually called somebody out who was posting a Substack articles that were blatantly chat GPT, blatantly. And I called them out in this article and kind of like very friendly, very nicely, but I was kind of like, so here's an example, guys. And like, you know, I don't know, what should, what should we do about this as a community? Do we call this out or not? And the guy ended up writing me in the comments and being like, this is really shitty, but like, you're totally right. I did do that with ChatGPT. I'll never do it again. I just deleted that post. And yeah, I'm never going to do that again. And I, so I have like mixed feelings about it. So so his his essay was about uh, uh, the phenomenon of clouds looking like shapes and the, the human brain finds shapes in clouds and that sort of thing. There's a word for it. But it's the kind of thing... Yeah, 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 that, yeah, yeah. And so it's this kind of thing where, like, if you put into chat GPT, hey, write me a 600-word essay um, about everything that's cool about that word, um, it spits out basically his essay. And yeah. you can do that But it's for... in such a stale style. I mean, who would want yeah. to read it? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, yeah. It just comes across as a business email. It's, I just don't like their, their house style. It's just so... It's just stale. I don't like so it. So should writers I, call that out? Or I, I, was I, I in the wrong? Start, you <laughs> I, know, think don't, you, don't I think you should. I mean, I could see doing that. I could see Justify doing that if you uh, you have like 10 YouTube channels and you're trying to just mm -hmm. automate content across a lot of really basic categories and you're using like make.com or whatever to just to, to, to uh, get content up there four or five times a day on the most you know, banal subject matter. But don't try to pass it off as something that came from you and your personality as kind of direct reflection into your thinking on something like Substack. I, I think, yeah, that's dubious. I you mean, know, if somebody wants chat to pass GPT, off chat GPT but... as their own personality, more power to them. <laughs> Why would you want to do that? Really, just unsubscribe. <laughs> read read what's engaging. You know, when AI-generated text becomes engaging, we can have another conversation, you know. But um, 
I, I just don't even see any need to address it. You know, sometimes I will include text that Claude has generated in my Substack post, but I always put it in a block quote, and I always say Claude said, and you know, block quote. Okay, well, you know why I called this guy out was because of the comments in his essay where people at the bottom of it were commenting, oh, this is so brilliant. This is so fascinating. Oh, I love your style. And oh, and and that's where that was the line that I drew because I was like, none of these people in the comments apparently have ever used chat GPT. <laughs> or all of those comments. Wow. Are okay, so that, that was your real motivation. You were, you were jealous of the... the <laughs> Engaged. Irritated. I mean, I don't know if jealousy is the right thing, but like irritated. Because no, no, like, no. I wouldn't put that out because I'd be embarrassed to put that out. So it wasn't jealousy, but. Well, you know, it's actually if you you could yeah you could, one way to spin that is jealousy. The other way to spin it is that you're actually seeing people, you're offended by the fact that people thought that this was worthy of yes. of celebrating. Like it came from someone's mind. It's like wow, like you're a little disappointed in people for for falling for that, and you sort of want to rescue them from that mediocrity. And so, uh, so, you, so you feel moved to call it out. So it's half ethical, half maybe motivated by some kind of sense of uh, unjustified engagement mm -hmm. or something, you know, but it's, it's a combination of human motivations. What is it about the account that is compelling enough that you read it? So I was actually, I, I scrolling through Substack, just clicked on it. Cause I was like, I don't know what this word is. And you know, how to catch a headline and, and, and all that. I, but I was one paragraph in, I was like, wait a second, hold up. And then I looked at like the other stuff that he was putting out and it was like all, all chat GPT. Although I will slightly quibble with what you said that <clears throat> chat GPT is not fun to read. You can actually play with it to the point where it can actually be pretty good if you start doing you can do absurd things like, hey, rewrite this bland essay in the style of a pirate. Or if a pirate is upset and like his ship is sinking and so he's like drastically and, and so and you can like like build it into you can have absurd layers of like voices that even a human couldn't do because you can you can make it complex and like absurd. And it's actually pretty you can you can have fun with it to the point where it's it's very fun to read. I agree, and I'll, I'll even amplify that. I'll say, just as I said, you know, with the uh, the image generation platforms, it takes a certain, there is a certain skill that goes into the prompting. People can get ChatGPT to produce text that you yourself couldn't get it to produce because they know how to interact with it. So, yeah, totally. But so, so this guy was not interacting with it in a skillful way. Yeah, I've, I've told, like, Claude before, just for fun, it's like, yeah, give me 500 words on this topic in the style of Hunter S. Thompson. You know, and it, it can't do a proper Hunter S. Thompson, but it does change its style. So, yeah, it does. Yeah. You know what might be fun? <laughs> you 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 ask uh, Chat GPT or Claude or something to um, provide 500 words on a subject. And then you take that and you pass it uh, through Gemini and you say, hey, Gemini, <laughs> write this as if you are Claude uh, <laughs> writing in a chat GPT style and then write and then hey chat GPT write this as if you were Claude that had been run through a chat GPT and then run through Gemini and then run back through chat GPT <laughs> and see if that generates anything interesting. So the one snag there is that these you know when you train a large language model you come up with a data set and then the the training run takes weeks and is very expensive costs huge amounts of money and electricity and you know um GPU or tensor processing unit, you know, compute cluster time. It's, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions of dollars. And so like Claude has a, a knowledge cutoff of, you know, like last November or something. And it doesn't have any experience. It doesn't have any reference for chat GPT-4.0, you know, which is the most uh, recent iteration of it that I've used. Uh, so they're kind of behind the times. Now, perplexity can search the web. Gemini can search the web, but they're they're not very creative at all. Pi is probably the best like uh, amalgamation of the two. It can search the web, and uh, you know it does have a lot of data on board, you know a lot of knowledge I would say on board. But again, it's the one that is the most hair triggered in terms of oh we can't talk about that. And not only can we not talk about that, I can't talk to you at all anymore. Sorry. So it's, it's both the most <laughs> open ended, but also hair trigger sensitive like to it's it's hair trigger sensitive in a way that is not intelligent it is clearly just you know there's a list of forbidden words and if you happen to use one done you can't reason with it you know the the, the conversation comes to a screeching halt 
your account is suspended. Huh. Uh, What's the but, point of being so open ended if it won't discuss so much? Or maybe well, I, I, again, I, it's it's not the LLM that's doing this. There there is a much more rigid sort of filter over it with just a list of forbidden terms. And if you happen to use one, it. you're done. You know, the model itself is is pretty subtle. It's it's nuanced. It's funny. It it is probably the funniest of all of them. It's got the best sense of humor of all of them. But again, it's got the nanny. It, that's weird. I, so I imagine it's by like the most extremely clever purveyor of dad humor ever or something. If it's if it has a really good personality or really it's really funny, but it also doesn't want to talk about a lot of stuff. It would have to lean into some very safe subjects and do that in a very, very clever way or something. I, um, uh, another another problem with Pi is that Microsoft just hired away all of their top talent. So it's it is. Um, it's an LLM that I think is not getting the updates and the, the love that it needs to stay relevant. So it's it's slowly withering away. So it, I had thought OpenAI uh, Open was was associated somehow with Microsoft, but uh, Microsoft Pi, is, Pi is not from OpenAI. Pi is. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry, OpenAI. Oh, oh that's, well, you that's just mentioned that Microsoft was taking some of their engineers. I thought just previous to all this that OpenAI and Microsoft were somehow uh, related they, to this. Yeah, they they do have. Um, uh, you know, business agreements and uh, open AI, um, you know, artificial intelligence is used in a lot of Microsoft products. I think it's it's open AI is behind all of the, um, the okay. Microsoft Copilot stuff. I was talking about Pi, which I think is from, is it Inflection? Is that the company? Um, yeah, they basically, Microsoft just bought, they're just, you know, headhunted all of their top talent, including their founder and CEO. So who's left, you know, running the ship at that company? I don't know. I can't hear you. You're muted. Okay, sir. Um, Anthropic got underway with a group of like uh, defectors from OpenAI. Wasn't that right? Yep. They thought they were that OpenAI wasn't taking AI safety seriously enough. Or is it the yep, other? that's Too exactly serious. right. All right. Yeah. And there's just been a second exodus from OpenAI of people with the exact same complaint, uh, and they are starting a company called SSI, which is Safe Super Intelligence. And uh, this is Ilya Suskiver's um, venture, and he says, you know, he's got venture capital lined up so that they never have to put out a product that generates income until they have achieved achieved super intelligence and it is proven safe so, so. achieved super intelligence and yeah. and it's all aligned as well huh. it is yes exactly well expect that to be unveiled in uh 2035 i think ah uh, who knows you know maybe never or maybe 2026 who knows yeah, they get back moving to that, quick, uh, right? This is I think that's Peter's point he's so making quickly. over and over again. <laughs> yeah, this discussion's not going to last long. I mean, this this recording of this conversation will have a short shelf life, other than as a sort of historical curiosity. Yeah, it is kind of crazy how much things come and go. Um, something about AI feels like it's the end of the line, or something like there's you know we used to thought you know we talked about three the last human invention. Right, it's, we're, it's the it's Nietzschean's last man for uh, tech fads. Well, um, I mean, like there there isn't genuine question right now about yeah, you know, ChatGPT, large language models, they're crazy, fascinating, amazing, but it it's a toss up whether or not that or biotech is going to be the thing that we're known for this decade. Um, you know, bioengineering is doing crazy things too, and. You know, maybe we're almost to the point where our lifespan ex extends another 200 years or something. Like that. that would change the game enormously, way more than anything that we can imagine that AI could do right now. Um, yeah. And probably, honestly, AI will be part of that because, I mean, like AI, there was a story going around two weeks ago about how um, AI is helping to find breast cancer five years before there's even a single sign of it. Like crazy things like that. I mean, like a AI is, is integrated into uh, medical technology a lot right now. And yeah. but yeah, I mean, right now, biotech, I think is I know way less about it, but it's kind of way more interesting at the same time, just because it, 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 the implications of it are so like, oh, some, you know, swath of the economy is going to go away. Like people are going to lose their jobs. It's not that it's like we may be post human a decade from now. Like it's so crazier. <laughs> Have yeah, you, 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 read, a shortage um, of jobs might be the least of our concerns. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Have you read Blood Music by Greg Bear? No. Okay, it's a short story, I think, from like 1982 or something. Uh, and it's about a biotech singularity. 
and it got expanded into a novel a few years later, but still in the 80s. And I highly recommend the novel, but just the short story by itself is is thought provoking and uh, sort of bowel freezing. You know, like just how quickly something, you know, like in the story, um, a sort of rogue bioengineer creates uh, individual cells. Each cell is as intelligent as like a child. And he cut a lot of ethical corners to get there and he gets fired and he's supposed to destroy his samples. And instead he injects them into his own body and then leaves the lab where they nice. start they start replicating and basically a whole society, you know, a whole like universe of, of minds exist within his body. And then they discover, oh, there's an outside of this body. Let's go there. You know, and this all happens very quickly. And it is, in terms of world building, it's great because it takes place probably around now. And, you know, as seen from the 80s, but there's so very little detail that the author gives about, you know, how the world works. It's everything's pretty much the same, except their cell phones. I mean, he he's predicted cell phones in a way that nobody prior to, you know, the advent of the actual smartphone ever got right. And um, it, it just, it holds up so well. So Blood Music, Greg Bear, the short story is probably available online for free. Seek it out. It's, it is, you know, however long it takes to read, half an hour, 40 minutes, whatever is time well spent. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Okay. I have to look that up. Uh, I mean, it does remind me that I've been hearing about since I was in high school, uh, nanobots, like nanotechnology, where you have little microscopic computers floating around in your bloodstream and they just fix you anytime anything ever goes wrong. And that is starting to maybe come online or, or you know, early, early versions of that is starting to come online. And so what if those nanobots <clears throat> that we all, you know, just take as a pill at some level someday. Um, what if they like have consciousness and we don't even know that they're conscious or something like that? It's not, it's not that absurd to think about. I mean, it's absurd, but it's not that absurd. I think of all the things we've talked about, that's the one that we need to worry about the least, uh, molecular yes. nanotechnology. It's it's yeah. the idea has been around for a long time. Uh, Engines of Creation by Eric Drexler, that's like what, 91 or something like that. Um, and he was you know, he got recruited by, was it a Clinton administration to be, you know, an official advisor? Or maybe it was, maybe it was the second Bush administration. But anyway, he's, there was a time when his notions about nanotechnology were taken so seriously that he was listened to in, you know, the highest halls of government. And it never worked out. It just never went anywhere. So maybe it will, but I'm yeah, not like holding my first, breath on that one. The first iteration of kind of like excitement around biotech, at least in my lifetime, was probably, uh, you know, cloning of that cheap dolly in the 90s. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, early 90s, I was just quite too young to be uh, uh, really paying attention to sort of the zeitgeist, you know, uh, I, unless it involved Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis. But I remember, <laughs> yeah, Dolly in, in the 90s. Uh, and then, yeah, it, things pop up and then they get sort of shelved for a while. Uh, I mentioned 3D printing. That's pretty narrow. It, it doesn't really kind of excite the mind like AI or biotech. But, yeah, right. 3D printing, whatever happened with that? Whatever happened with 3D printing's uh, threat to safety with the constant generation of plastic guns. I mean, it turns out that hasn't really borne out. It hasn't been borne there out. Are, there are plenty of high quality human machined guns. You know, we don't really need <laughs> plastic printed things. Engine of Creation, Engines of Creation by K. Eric Drexler, 1986 is when he published that book. So oh, obviously the ideas earlier. have been cooking for a while. Yeah. So, yeah, Star Trek flirted with nanobot stuff a lot and uh, in emergent consciousness. I, I think there was even a Star Trek episode called Emergence or something, uh, Next Generation. Um, nanobots would have been pretty technical and mind-blowing for the original series to have broached something like that. They, they were doing more kind of exotic alien and, and action and, and something almost kind of medieval drama and stuff. Um, but yeah, there was a Voyager episode about a like a nuclear warhead that... Okay, you introduce Star Trek at your peril. I, I am a encyclopedic trekkie okay well and you know you remember this one right the uh they, they find uh like an unexploded warhead on a planet with an ai built in that was meant to be a very narrow kind of ai that uh whose you know sort of imperative was essentially made obsolete when it didn't go off and that the war that it was being with part of uh you know years pass and it just becomes moot uh, but it, devins, it, it de develops this consciousness that is you know, extremely motivated to finish its, its job. It won't take instructions that, uh, you know, the war is over. It, 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 it has a kind of, you know, this, this very stubborn personality. Um, and the, it ends up being expressed through that holographic doctor 
you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, it gets really silly with this kind of this, this evil motivation on its part. But yeah, you know, how uh, how uh, kind of more generalized consciousness can can emerge from a very narrow domain of uh, intelligence. You know, that's that's <laughs> something that you ever I see before. Dark Star, John Carpenter's first film. Actually, no. Oh, it. Near the end, somebody before has to Halloween. try to. Okay. Somebody, oh yeah, definitely before Halloween. He, somebody, is trying to uh, talk a bomb, an intelligent bomb, out of exploding, and they're doing it with philosophy, and uh, doesn't work. But it's it's very silly. It's written though by Dan O'Bannon, uh, who wrote the script for Alien, and it's kind of like the first pass of Alien, but comedic and super low budget. Uh, that sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah. Alien, a, is very, Alien is very interesting. Like I, I like the um, you know, the most recent Alien. I was kind of disappointed in it, uh, but the, yeah. the the two before that, I've grown to appreciate them, especially Prometheus. They, they really are elaborating on the the story of um, the the uh, embodied AI. You know, David or or Ash in the first Alien. Uh, that's almost like it could be its own universe. And and they're they're, they're uh, the nexus between the uh, what were they called the creators? The engineers. Uh, that's also underexplored and, and super cool. Uh, the creators kind of came back in the newest one in, in a really kind of corny way, but um, yeah. So the you know the uh, the AI in the form of you know David, um, the creators. I think those are sort of the most heady aspect of that entire franchise, and then the aliens are just kind of the cool horror action element to it all. You could really pull all those things apart and make them their own thing. Well, I, I can jabber about sci-fi media if. Forever, so let me see if Peter has anything. Well, okay, to say did about you that. like the '90s well, Outer Limits? The '90s Outer Limits, I liked it. It doesn't look very good now. Uh, it, it's worse technical, uh, technically than even the Next Generation is. But uh, but those were some cool, cool stories there. I missed that. I was I was in my 20s in the '90s, so uh, I was doing other stuff. <laughs> oh, I, okay. I was going to say, I, um, did you guys catch the? Uh, interview of peter Thiel on joe rogan the other week i just read a reference to it uh but no i didn't see it although yeah. what what i was reading like peter Thiel, he did a series of conversations with david graber you know the author of debt the first five thousand years Graber's i saw you post now. about i saw you post about that earlier on substack came up and, and it was david graber who said look we were promised flying cars and we got you know 120 characters or whatever twitter limit used to be and um they had a series of, of conversations, and now that Graeber is dead, Peter Thiel seems to be carrying on that, you know, that rhetorical line. That's such, I didn't. I've heard him say that a million times. I didn't know he got he got that from David Graeber. That's very interesting. <laughs> oh, uh, Peter Thiel got that from Graeber. Oh, okay, yeah, I've been uh, citing Thiel for that. Oh, all right. Yeah, me too. No, no. I mean, you you can reference Thiel now because uh, David Graeber has moved on. Uh, he's you know. Wherever we go after we die, if we go anywhere, that's where he is. So um, yeah, I, I thought David Graeber, well, he was in like an he was an anarchist or something, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't. I mean, there is, of course, that strange, somewhat anarchic element to uh, a lot of the, uh, the high end tech bros with, you, you know, it's of a, you know, anarcho capitalist variety. But there's still some thematic overlap between the non capitalist anarchists. Um but yeah, the way that David Graeber, you know, the, the mantle's been passed to Teal in, in a sense, that reminds me of, uh, you know, James C. Scott. Uh, that guy died recently. He was an anarchist. He did like kind I, of ethnography. I don't know that, that book, Seeing Like a State. And um, and then, uh, you know, he, after his death, some of his leftist friends were surprised that so many libertarians were familiar with him. I uh, actually brought up Teal because he had a very interesting critique of sci-fi films that I think is never mentioned often enough. But he was saying how, how like, in... in almost all like the space opera sci-fis they can all travel faster than the speed of light and the second you can do that you're basically a demon because you can Warning. destroy someone before they even know that you're coming at all from all the way across the galaxy you can destroy them before there's any sign of it and so he's like it's so like hilarious that Okay, all these civilizations, they travel faster than the speed of light, and then they come together, and then they're, like, shooting bullets at each, at each other at, like, the yeah. slowest yeah. pace ever, like, going past each other, like, 50 miles an hour. And it's, like, that's also my critique of Marvel movies, too, because they have all these powers, and then they end up in fist fights. Like, it's so stupid. So, yeah. like, at, at okay, some man. level, sci-fi either needs to, like, dial back the technology or get a little bit more creative with, like, the fight scenes or something. I, I thought that that was pretty fast. Well, yeah. you know, really superlative technology about like that is going to have 
a dramatic change or a dramatic transformation in culture. And yet that's really hard to imagine. And if even if you could imagine it in any detail with any accuracy, it's hard to relate to as the audience member. So yeah. you, you need to keep the, the characters relatable, which means you're really never going to give the actual technology the full consideration because you can't really pursue how it's going to affect human psychology and sociology and governance and, you know, the coordination of effort and the distribution of, you know, the provision of the, the populace with what they need materially. Like the technology affects all of that. But if you if you get too far from what's familiar, the story becomes unrelatable. You know, one so thing what, I've never liked about one thing always annoyed me with uh, Star Trek uh, Next Generation, especially, but I guess the original series kind of did that, and Voyager as well. Uh, well, Voyager and TNG, they would they would throw in all these references to the 20th century. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, so William Riker from Alaska loves jazz and stuff. And then like, <laughs> who's that? Um, Tom Paris. You yes. know, they, 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 it's sort of like it, it's almost like offensive. Like um, these are like parodies of 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 20th century white guy interests. <laughs> like Tom Paris, oh, he loves 50s sci-fi. Like the yeah. world of Dr. Demento or something. It's like, really, man, you're like 400 years in the future and that excites you? I mean, there's yeah. got to be something that had to have happened in the interim that is much more cool than much cooler than that. Why couldn't he be why couldn't he be very retro? But he's retro about, you know, the culture of 2238 through roughly 2278 or something, you know, like it's, they pander too much. Well, there's a budgetary aspect to that. You know, every single Star Trek show, they the crew travels back in past, you know, back in time to the present. And the present is just, you know, the year that the show was made. So you know, why is it that uh, on, you know, on Enterprise, they travel back to the early 2000s? But in, in Star Trek, the original series, they travel back to the 60s. And, you know, on Picard, they travel back to the 2020s. It's just, um, it's easy, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, there are some smarter television shows, and uh, I think something like uh, Dark Matter, I can't find a way to, I'm trying to finagle the, the show Dark Matter, which I, I mentioned uh, briefly. I think you got up for that, Peter. If you've watched that Dark Matter on Apple TV, it's pretty good. Um, you know, sci-fi today is smarter, and they would do something like the year, you know, it takes place in the 2500s, uh, and the, but they go back to just 40 years before that. I mean, Foundation does things like that on Apple TV. That's pretty good based on Isaac Asimov. Um, yeah, I feel a little bit intimidated. You guys are so literary and I, all I can do is talk about TV shows for the most part. So, but um, yeah, so um, they, they're getting more sophisticated. Uh, well, sure. while Peter was gone, I mentioned Severance, and we didn't talk about it in any detail, but Severance, I think, is a nice uh, crossroads between literary and uh, sci-fi because it is, it's very psychological. It is very concerned with, you know, the psychological nuances of the characters and the sci-fi element is just the, you know, the premise that you could split your consciousness and, you know, one half is always at home and the other half is always at work. And, you know, you flip the coin when you undergo the operation, you want to be the person on permanent vacation and you certainly don't want to be the person who's always at the office. Uh, but, you know, beyond that, that sci-fi premise, it's all, you know, it's it's about capitalism. It's about society. It's about you know our relationship to work and how we have to put on a, a fake persona in order to operate at work. But what if you can never take it off? You know, what if you can never leave? Yeah. It's a very interesting like workplace sci-fi that has a vaguely 1980 look, mm -hmm. like uh, kind of like, like just Gattaca, like 1978 to 82 or something like right in there. You so aesthetically, the it's really cool too, kind of retro. You remember the movie Gattaca? With, uh, I think Ethan Hawke. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've seen. Uh, I, I actually only watched like half of it. For some reason, I could oh. not get into it. But I like the premise. Great premise. But the the vision of the future is one that is very uh, conservative. It's like everybody's wearing like it's an astronaut training program, but they go to work in suits and ties. You know, like the astronauts from the '60s. Um, <laughs> even when they get in the spaceship to go into space, they're wearing suits and ties. So it's it's, it's a very and all the cars are retro. It's like it's one of these things where if it's so hard to imagine, you know, to accurately predict what will come. It's it's kind of a cheat to just say, OK, well, things like fashion are cyclical. So let's mm -hmm. in the 2070s, let's make it look like the 20, you know, like the 1950s. Like that's that's the beauty of Blade Runner. Have it, you guys it, seen uh, uh, Looper? Oh, yeah. Sci-fi film Looper. Yeah, that was there was this. I just rewatched it. There's this beautiful line in it where there's a, you know, the, the, the main like quote unquote bad guy is from the future. And he's like the boss of all the loopers. And 
uh, so Joseph Gordon Levitt comes in and he's wearing like his his suit and tie type get up. And uh, the, the bad guy is like, what is with you in these like clothes? He's like throwback, like detective clothes. Try something new. Like, do you realize that like this is so passe and so stupid? Like you're alive now in the present. Do something now. Do something current and forget about the past and the future. Like be yourself, be real. And he has this, this I'm, I'm actually like butchering it, but he has this, like this great monologue. that's just so just kind of like, damn, that's, that was so real, like almost breaking the fourth wall for this scene it was so good um i actually have a hard stop guys i hate to hate to say it so i'm gonna have to yeah. bounce but uh kmo is, is great to meet hour. you yeah we can i just uh, subscribed to your uh sub stack so i'm looking forward to reading more of that and right um, back but yeah thanks for having me on dane i'll uh, see you cool. soon take care peter yeah i was just gonna mention on uh gattaca somebody mentioned um recently that uh, i need to see it again but they uh they they, they said that the set is actually very minimal like yeah. it's as if it's almost a stage play and i do vaguely recall that um so yeah that's kind of interesting they seem to seem to have done a lot perhaps with a small budget i have no idea how small the budget really was maybe it wasn't small but yeah, yeah so I, in terms yeah. of special effects there's nothing there are no special effects. Yeah. you never you never see the spaceship that he goes up in you just see a close-up of him you know inside of it yeah it's, it's really all about the concept and the writing and the the acting performances yeah one last movie i, I want to mention here um and now this is some of the softest sci-fi uh at least that you could put to film um it, it's called the man from earth and i think it was actually based on a book and it's a, it's just about a guy a, a retiring college professor well he's not well he's leaving the, the professorship he's, he's he's moving on in life he's not really retirement age but i guess you could say he's retiring so he gathers all his professor friends around and um he slowly oh, eats, I, yeah another one. He them into the conversation at first suggesting that he is very old and he, and eventually all but saying it outright and he's so convincing that they, they start to be pretty upset with him either for lying about him being a normal human being or somehow gaslighting them and, and making them question their sanity it's pretty pretty cool yeah I, and that's super low budget it all takes place really? like just at a house out out in the like the desert and there's no other locations and it's just people sitting on the couch talking that is something people like, you know, just historians of the physical science or something could have all just put together. It's just really I thought that was really phenomenal movie done with very little. Um, it's Another film movie. like that, that that really does a lot with very little in terms of set and, and actors and whatnot is Coherence. Have you seen that one? Yes. Yeah, that was really good, too. Very yeah, I good. remember it's uh, some uh, the parallel universe type stuff, uh, something like that. And it's just very slight. And yeah, that that was really well done, too um yeah there's some late, great little gems out there they they made a man from earth too uh like 10 years later is don't need to see it I okay know. i i don't think i did yeah in I that one know, i knew there was a sequel yeah in that one he's moved on to a new town and like he he's a professor again uh and uh these students start to suspect that he's really old you know like he's you know he's just he's just immortal or something not that he can't die because I remember they broached that. They said, in all these years, you've never had an accident. And, and you just said something like, some people are lucky that way. And that's not a very satisfying answer in a way. <laughs> no. Anyway. But he probably uh, doesn't know, you know, the nature of his own existence. Yeah. He's almost like a, um, I read recently that uh, turns out alligators are some weird animal that doesn't actually age. They still die because um, eventually they get so large that they can't, they can no longer feed themselves and keep up with their needs. But they actually don't you know kind of age in the way other animals do that's that's very fascinating um they just get bigger and bigger until it's no longer tenable um all right greenland sharks as well i think there oh are yeah some which are several hundred years old that they found like they, they they found one that had a harpoon and bailed in it that the harpoon was clearly hundreds of years old wow that's so cool okay well camo yeah i guess i'll uh wrap it up now and um Enjoy Arkansas. Uh, all I don't know too much about it. I, I would, if I had money, I'd just go and uh, and I had a nomadic, digital nomad life like so many of my friends. It kind of it bugs me, but yeah, I'd just go out and stay there for a bit, just for the hell of it. Well, the northwest corner is absolutely beautiful. The Ozarks, yeah. right? They're yeah. Kind of in that area. Yeah. That's that reminds me of a TV show, Ozark. Not sci-fi at all, but also very good. I've heard uh, good things about it. I haven't seen it. Yeah, it's kind of a Breaking Bad knockoff, but they do their own thing. You know, family man gets into drug trade stuff. All right, cool. Thanks for talking, Camo. I'll probably have this part one of this talk out in like a week or something. Cool, man. Take care. 
right.